Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I'll also be your host for today. In these webinars, we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools for the life sciences community. Each month we hear about a bioinformatics topic that we hope will support Australians to deliver their best agricultural, environmental and medical research. You can keep up to date with the latest news and events from Australian Biocommons via the links listed on your screen. Before we begin today, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, in Brisbane, this is the Turrbal and Yagara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Saskia Freitag to the webinar to speak to us about getting started with R. Saskia completed her master's in statistical science at the University College London. After finishing her master's, she moved back to Germany, where she completed a PhD in biostatistics in 2014 at the University of Göttingen. She then got the opportunity to relocate to Melbourne, where she worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute for five years. She now works as a senior postdoctoral fellow with Professor Ryan Lister at the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research. Her research focus is analysis of and method methodological development for single cell omics data. Welcome to the webinar, Saskia, and I'll now hand over to you to get started. Thank you. Perfect, all right. So I'm going to talk to you about getting started with R today. So first of all, what is R? Well, when you look on their website, it says R is a free software for statistical computing and graphics. When you go on the Wikipedia, it's a little bit more elaborate there. And it says R is a programming language and free software environment for statistical computing and graphics. So now we know it's got something to do with programming and apparently there are graphics involved and statistics is important, but it doesn't really tell you what R can do or how you might want to use it. So I'm just gonna start with what I use R for. So I use R as a programming language. Well, that's kind of obvious. It's not the most sophisticated programming language, but you can make little programs with R. I finally use it as a calculator almost once a week because I can just very quickly pull it up and put little calculations in it and it will give me an answer so it's kind of handy for that it's probably not the most again not the most sophisticated use here it's a statistical analysis tool as this is its most natural sort of use case and it's very powerful for this and that's what i use it for every day um, but it's also a visualization platform and again it is a very powerful one it produces these incredibly pretty graphics that are actually quite professional. It's also a document editor. I can make PDFs, Word documents, even HTMLs, and it's super useful as that. Because it can create HTMLs, it's also a website editor. Um, it's maybe not the most sophisticated here, but it's effective and simple. So you can see this example website. It can also be used for presentations. This is a presentation created by Emmy um, Tanaka. I wouldn't use it for presentations because it's actually quite difficult in my opinion. And uh, it's, there's a lot of mental overload there, but you know, it makes very pretty presentations. Um, in the same way, it's an application maker. So you can make these wonderful little applications, but, and these are incredibly useful and popular and really extend your data analysis to other people that might not be able to program. Um, so that's really neat in my opinion. It's also an art generator for some people and I find this very incredible um, that you can make things like this in R. Um, and there are probably many more of these esoteric type uses, um, but that's, yeah, it's not me, but other people do this. And to me, R, really importantly, is a community. 
So I'm a member of the Our Ladies community, which you see in this hex sticker, and you have already seen some of these hex stickers, but you're going to see more of them. And it's, um, so these hex stickers, they can, they normally denote communities, they're kind of those logos for them, or programs, or little packages, which we will touch on later. So to me, it's a community because there are loads of like-minded people that use R, that share what they do with R, um, that they and they're kind and supportive. And to me, one of those communities is the use R community, um, where once a year people that use R from business to research meet and talk about how they use R and how to improve R. Um, so now that I've kind of whetted your appetite for R, let's talk about how to get R. So the easiest way to get R is just, you're just going to Google it. You're just going to Google R statistical software, and then you're going to download whatever you get there. And that's probably going to end up with you getting a really antiquated and rudimentary development environment. So maybe not the best way to start. So I, what I want to tell you to use is RStudio. Again, RStudio, like R, is free of four personal use there is a charge for commercial use um, and you can pretty simply just again download r studio it'll come with a version of r um, you can also update um, r versions that will come out later r updates once a year so that's just some sorry once or twice a year um, so that's just something to keep in mind um, so why R Studio? I think R Studio is super neat because it offers you really a modern integrated development environment that specializes in R. And it really helps you with programming and keeping track of your data analysis by allowing you really to see multiple aspects of what programming involves. And I liken this to the cooking process. So when you cook, what you need is kind of a recipe, you need your ingredients, you're going to have your cook stove. And then at the end of it, once you're done, you wanna play the meal. And this, so, you, so you're going to use different aspects of the kitchen. And our studio is kind of like your kitchen. So you're going to have your recipes that you write up here in your pane and the ingredients that you will have loaded into your R on the right hand side that you can see and follow. And then you have um, a console, which is kind of like the cooking stove where you execute what you have written in the recipes. And then finally, once you make graphics, they're going to appear here, which is kind of like your plating station. So um, on top of offering sort of your full functionality of a kitchen, R Studio also has some features that really help you with programming data analysis um, that you're going to frequently use, such as um, version control um, with GitHub, so or with Git. Um, which, if you're familiar with what that is, then you know that this is great. If not, just forget what I just said um, because there's not enough time to explain. Then there's also um, the terminal, which you can really easily ex um, re really easily um, enter for, from R Studio by just using this um, pane down here, and you can execute little commands there. For example, SSHing into your server. Um, but there's also other neat functionalities like tab completion in order to um, find functions or put the right arguments into functions, searches. Um, as well as little code snippets that you can use. All right, so when, R, when you initially load R onto your computer, R capabilities are kind of modest, maybe in comparison to, you know, Prism um, or Starter or these other types of programs. But the cool thing with R is that it can be extended almost infinitely. And this is by something that we call packages. So I've always already kind of hinted at packages by these hex stickers that we've seen around. Um, so packages are user created pre-compiled little, little software programs um, that allow the use of specialized statistical techniques, graphical tools, import export type functions, and even the importing of completely, like complete other different languages such as Python through the reticulate package. Um, so packages can be downloaded from two places. 
um, or actually there are more than two places, but these are the two places that I'm going to mention because they have the most packages and they are most important to what we are talking about, which is bioinformatics. So the first place is CRAN, which just hosts packages that are kind of for generalized use. And it, to this date, it hosts over 10,000 packages. So it's quite large. Um, and you're going to probably find something there that will help you with your analysis. The other place is Bioconductor, which I'll touch on later again, which is um, a, a repository which collects software packages for high throughput genomic data. And to this date, it hosts over 2000 packages, um, which is incredible. And these help you really help you with your high throughput um, genomic data analysis. So installation of these packages is actually quite simple. We, um, as long as they live on CRAN or Bioconductor for CRAN, you're going to use this installed up packages um, command. And then once it's installed every time after, you're just going to use the library statement as um, shown here with um, ggplot in order to load the packages, uh, the, sorry, the functions that are associated with the package. Um, with RStudio, you can also do all of this interactively via a different pane. Um, so in Bioconductor, this install packages is not going to work. It's a little bit different and I've put it down at the bottom. Um, there are also packages that do not live on any of these repositories, but live on GitHub um, because people haven't submitted them to the repositories yet. And there is um, installation functions um, in particular in a package called remotes or dev tools that you can use in order to install those. Um, okay, so now that we have an understanding of what R can offer, how we can develop sort of programs and data analysis for R via R Studio, and how we can extend its capabilities, what I want to present to you is now a type of project in R that is that R is probably most commonly used for sort of a data analysis type project. And I'm not going to take you through the steps and I'm not going to teach you how to program here. I'm just going to go through what I would have kind of liked to know when I started out. Sort of the tools and the packages that might help you during your data analysis journey. All right. So a data project in my mind involves the following steps and involves organizing your project first into a folder, then reading in the data from that folder into R. So R can, is actually aware of the data and you, know, you can start using that data. Then data wrangling, which is just a process of cleaning up your data and putting information into your data in order that you can analyze it to the extent that you want to analyze it. Then the analysis and then once that's done, sort of a visualization output often. And finally, you just kind of want to wrap it all together into a report that you can push out to people so they can see what you have done. Um, so let's make this a little bit more concrete, this example. So let's assume we have a data set that is on penguins, on different species of penguins, and we have collected some data on characteristics of these different penguin species. And we want to compare them now and see how these species differ. So we've got a CSV that co contains our data here. And so the first thing we're gonna want to do is create with our studio, create something that's called an R project. And you can find this on the files, new project, and then this little pop-up will appear and then you can click new directory and make a directory that is an R studio project. And why I'm telling you to use this is because this really keeps you organized. This keeps everything you're going to do regarding this data analysis project in one folder. And our studio will also know what you have previously done and where you're situated. So with computers, it's often the case that you have to set path to tell it exactly where it is. And this will prevent you from having to do this over and over again, because our studio will already know where you're living. All right, next, once you have in into this project, you have put your um, data in, in a data folder, 
um, and you can structure this any way you like, which is kind of neat as well. You then want to read in that data into R so you can start using it. And for this, um, if it's a CSV, so a comma separated file, um, which is what we often get um, when we use Excel, we can use just simply use the read.csv function, which is already comes with the initial version of R. But if it's a little bit more complicated, then there are heaps of specialized packages such as read R, Google Drive, or Feather, which allow you to um, load completely different data formats. And then when you're talking bioinformatics, um, Bioconductor has heaps of packages that are just really trying to make import and export for your data types a lot easier. Um, all right, once you've imported the data into R, um, what you typically want to do is wrangle your data. And this is where st statisticians and bioinformaticians spend about 80% of their time, I would say. It's cleaning data up, making, structuring it in a way, enriching it, and um, really getting it together and getting it ready for analysis. Um, and there is a whole type of ecosystem that was built around that question, which is called the tidyverse. And within this tidyverse universe of packages, I want to just, I'm just going to showcase the plier here, um, which allows you to wrangle data really, really easily. And um, yeah, it's, it's just kind of the way to go and it's great. So I would really recommend you getting into what we call the tidyverse and dplyr in particular, um, because it makes this really easy and it makes the statements that you're going to be writing really readable for you to like understand what you've done later on. So once the data is in the right shape, it's off to analysis time. And um, again, CRAN and R, even the rudimentary version of R, really offer you many, many functions for data analysis in particular, such as doing a principal component analysis. But when you're working with high throughput genomic data, such as DNA, RNA, methylation, and so on, then you're probably going to want something that is a little bit more comprehensive and specialized towards this. And this is where Bioconductor comes in. So Bioconductor, again, specializes in really the analysis and comprehension of high throughput genomic data. And the other thing that's really neat about Bioconductor is that it has a really big focus on making users be able to use the packages, unlike CRAN, which means that a lot of those, all of these packages here are incredibly well documented and come with little tutorials within it so that you can actually use it. And that's what we call a vignette. So watch out for the little vignettes because these will help you to be doing um, uh, data analysis. Um, um, the other thing that I want to point out is it's not just vignettes, which are like little tutorials that only use one package, but they're also workflows which show you really for one data type, like let's say RNA, um, how you would go about, in, for example, analyzing an RNA sequencing experiment from start to finish using multiple packages often. Um, Finally, once you're done with your analysis, what you typically want to do is like visualize a result. Also, visualization is important during exploration. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And R has actually several frameworks for visualizing data. Um, and the one that I use and I think is probably the most powerful and the most professional looking at the end is ggplot2. So the only problem with ggplot2 is that it then again makes you learn a little bit of another syntax because unlike sort of traditional R, you're going to start seeing these pluses appearing here, which is a tiny little, it's just a, a syntax that you're going to have to come to grasp for it. But it's well worth learning because in the end, you can produce plots like this that look incredibly professional um, and you know are publication ready often with sometimes a little tweaks here and there. Once that's done, you're going to want to summarize it in a report, maybe not just for you, uh, for, for other people, but also for you so that you can keep track of what you've actually done. And for this, R Markdown is an incredible package. So what R Markdown allows you to do is to keep code results, graphics and explanatory text 
all in the same document and create a PDF, an HTML, or even a Word document from it. So this can look something like this. And um, this is a while, again, you have to learn a little bit of syntax here that is not sort of standard R syntax. This will allow you to work reproducibly by really documenting every step of the way that you have taken in your data analysis project. All right, so I hope I have kind of explained how you would go through um, or how you would start with going through um, a data analysis type, um, type project. Along the way in any project, inevitably you will stumble on an error message. This is just programming and you're going to have to start debugging. Um, and sorry, and debugging in R can be incredibly frustrating. That's just the nature of debugging, but it's also one of the most rewarding stages in my opinion of any project. So with debugging, it will take you a lot of time in the beginning to debug your errors, but with sort of experience, this will become a much, much quicker exercise. So just a couple of pointers when it comes to debugging in R. I think error messages are actually pretty helpful in R because you can Google them, unlike in Python where they're pretty long and very, very confusing. Um, so, you know, Google your error messages and sort of nine in 10 times you'll find someone else has had that problem. And there is a pretty good explanation on somewhere like Stack Overflow. Um, you, R is interactive programming. So you can run one line by line instead of having to run a complete pro, um, program. And this really, and it's really easy to do. So use those interactive capabilities to your advantage. Make it, make anything that you're trying to do repeatable. So try different examples of data, not just your own, so that other people when you when you post this question to other people, they can actually sort of see where the error occurs and then help you out. And finally, and this is really important to me, is remember that R really is is R is a strange beast at times. So R really, really wants to complete any call that you're giving it. So this can result in really weird behavior, which often doesn't result in an error message when it should be resulting in an error message. Um, and then in the end, leads to results that are not right and you don't know where the error has actually ha happened. So just keep this in mind. And one example here is that we have a vector here and we're adding just a one to the vector. And what R does is that it actually adds the one to every single element of the vector because what it has done internally is that it's extended that first one into a vector of three ones and then matched it to the other vector. And this is the sort of non-standard behavior that can really, really quickly lead to sort of problems down the line. So just keep that in mind because this is where things, where things typically go wrong. Um, so sometimes you may get stuck, so stuck that you do not, you know, none of this debugging stuff will help you out. And this is where you want a community that you can ask a question to and you may not have a colleague that you can just tap on the shoulder and be like, hey, I have this problem. Can you have a look at this? So there are online communities for you here. So Stack Overflow is one that I've already mentioned and you'll find heaps of answers there and Google often leads you to Stack Overflow. There's also RStats Twitter where there are loads of great people live on RStats Twitter and are happy to answer questions. Um, but maybe for the ones that are not on Twitter, there are also lots of forums that, that offer support, like the R Open Science Forums, very, very friendly community, the R Studio community, as well as the Bioconductor Support Forum for more specialized bioconductor questions. And finally, if you are sort of more in the direct type interactions, that's where you're living, then check out the R Ladies Slack where you can ask questions and pretty immediately get answers to your questions. Um, so I hope you find a community for you because I think that's one of the most rewarding parts of R. Um, so 
if you want to start learning R after you now kind of, um, you know, talk to you through what R can do and like how you would approach it, um, where are the best resources for actually starting? So I'm just taking this Twitter post from Jesse who um, offers these following um, tips and those are all links. So when we share the slides later on, you can just click on these links and um, find these resources. So Modern Dive is a textbook that uses R. It's a free textbook. Um, uh, all of these resources are free. And um, it's, it, it goes through statistical principles as well as how you would approach um, certain analysis with R. And it's just a really lovely and comprehensive um, book. There is R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham, who is the chief scientist of our studio. And this is another um, this is another really good resource of learning R in a pretty comprehensive way. Um, and especially having a focus on the tidyverse. This is extended in um, STAT 545 by Jenny Bryant. Um, which is another wonderful resources and also helps you with things like version control. And then maybe something that's a little bit more exciting, it's Combook Data Science, which is an actual accredited course that you can take in order to um, become a data scientist. Um, and this uses R on, and is designed for using R in a way that where there is a, you know, you have a computer that might not be quite as powerful. Um, and then for something completely different, there is Swirl, which teaches you R within R um, by using a package. And this is just a package that you can download. Um, so I just hope that one of these works for you. All right. So I guess we're at the question and answer time. And I just kind of want to say that, you know, I'm, my R journey is still going on. I've been using R for more than 10 years now but you know with the more the more I see I think I'm kind of on this downward graph where I've joined our Twitter and I've see what other people use R for and I'm always amazed and I know that my knowledge is kind of you know I thought I was here at the peak but I'm really probably quite at the bottom in 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 the valley rather than there all right thank you so much Thanks Saskia for that great introduction to R, a bit of a taste of what you can use it for and some pointers on different packages you can use. We do now have time for questions. You can write those into the Q&A panel in the Zoom dashboard. So we do have a couple of questions coming through already. The first one on my list here is, what are the um, pros and cons and differences between R and other software like GraphPad Prism? So yeah, so this is a great question. Um, so the difference is that GraphPad and Prism are interactive languages. So it's a clicky tool and that comes with, with its limitations. Um, there is a certain analysis that won't be that won't be in GraphPad or Prism, and it's not as extendable as R. So um, you won't be able to do this. But the most important difference, I think, is in reproducible analysis, right? With R, this lets you record exactly what you have done every single step of the way by writing a program, whereas with Prism, it's really difficult to actually, you know, write out exactly what steps you have done in a clicky, pointy software. And that will make it really hard for you to exactly repeat that analysis the next time. Thanks a lot for that answer. So the next question is, um, when starting data analysis through R, what are the basic packages you would recommend installing straight away? So I would, the Tidyverse is a good start for anyone to just install that and ggplot2, but I'm not someone who would say, go and install everything at the start, but rather than go develop your analysis, see what you need and then install it when it comes up. Um, that's the way that I roll. Obviously like things like ggplot2, um, DevTools are probably things that, you know, you just gonna wanna have initially because you're going to need it pretty much from the start. But yeah, apart from that, just see how it goes. I guess that depends on 
what kind of data you're dealing with as well because there are many yeah. different packages out there depending on, on what type Absolutely. of data you're but working. I wouldn't my point is I wouldn't get bogged down in oh my god I have to install all of this before I can start no just get started and then once you get to that sort of roadblock go google find what you need install it see if it works see if it even solves your problem and then you know go from there <laughs> that's a good suggestion I think uh, and then related to that for complete beginners would you recommend uh, using the tidyverse straight away or learning some basic R syntax first so this is a hugely controversial discussion in the R world every single time but I, I think it depends a little bit on what you're going to try to want to use it later on for but let's say you are just you know you're just trying to get your data analysis done and I think the tidyverse is absolutely fine for that learn start with the tidyverse i think it's a great introduction and it really teaches you good software principles as well development principles so it's it's a great way to start in my opinion great thank you lots of questions coming in so the the next question is uh, what are some basic uh commands where do you find them and how do you remember them um yeah <laughs> so I think, you know, the, all of these introductory um, courses that I have put up will teach you the very basic R commands. So go there. And the way to remember them is, to be honest, I, I only remember the very basic, basic R commands. And you will pretty quickly too, because you're going to use them so often that it'll just become natural. Um, with like you know tab completion does really help you with remembering some of them so you only have to remember the first letter that can someone sometimes be life-saving um so that's why our studio is great but other than that you know i google i would say like at least 50 percent of the commands i use all the time and that's super normal for everyone so don't be afraid of doing that and with the time you repeat it memory starts happening <laughs> Google is definitely your friend in the world of bioinformatics. Um, I had another question on my list and I've just lost the place. Oh, here it is. So there's a couple of people are asking about um, how is R different from starter or starter? I'm not sure how to say that. Ooh, so I have to admit that the last time I used starter was like more than 10 years ago, I think. Um, so to me, what Starter just doesn't offer is nice visualizations. Every visualization that I've seen in Starter looks horrible. And again, it's just not as extendable as R. So, but again, like it, it, it depends what you're doing. If you are an econ, if you're doing economics, Starter is probably your friend. You can probably do the same things in R, but this is just where people feel more comfortable with. But I would say, the graphic capabilities of R compared to even Python are just so much more incredible that it's, you know, if that's where your output lies, it seems insane to use anything else. Thank you very much. How are we going for time? We've still got a bit of time up our sleeve. So there's a couple more questions. And uh, these are getting more into the realm of recommendations for, um, different types of analysis. Someone is asking about, they have no experience with R and they want to gain some understanding of single cell analysis in R. Would you recommend, uh, it's just disappeared off my screen. Would you recommend learning the R basics or just learning to use a certain package? I guess you kind of have to uh, do both there. You have to do both. I mean, it's going to, it's going to be really difficult to, to like just dive straight straight in but it doesn't have to be a long course it can just literally be the very basic syntax of what's a vector how do i do the basic math operations what's how do i assign an object how do i load some data and then you are probably ready to start a tutorial so i really like um the orchestrated analysis for single cell pipeline book Oscar, I, 
and I'm going to have I'm going to have missed a letter here, but it's called Oscar without the R at the end. And yeah, that's I think that's a wonderful textbook. And I will let someone know where it is um, that for single cell analysis, and it will take you through every step and explain most importantly why you're doing certain analysis and what you should be watching out for. I think it's worth pointing out as well that there are lots of packages there already. You don't have to completely write the code from scratch yourself. I think this is exactly as for complete. This is something that I had to learn when I started to, to use R and it was really reassuring to know that I didn't have to invent this whole thing. I could just take it and use it. I just had to learn a little bit of the language and the syntax to get going. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, it's all about finding the packages that have already pre-compiled these analysis that you want to do and you can just apply them to your data set and, you know, check that what comes out makes sense. And yeah, the Oscar pipeline is the, the most wonderful book of using different packages and really walking you through all the different types of analysis that you might want to be doing on your single cell data set. Uh, so there's a question on sometimes a package does not work for a particular version of R. What's the solution for that? Oh, yeah. Um, so there is often, yeah, there, uh, uh, so my first try when I get to this type of problem would be to see whether it's available on Bioconductor because Bioconductor can often be out of sync with the CRAN repository. So what you need to know about the Bioconductor repository is that it essentially clones the CRAN repository. But um, the CRAN so the CRAN repository can update at any time, whereas the Bioconductor repository only updates twice a year and includes new packages, which means that at you know any given time point, um, everything that is in the Bioconductor repository will work together, which is great. So what sometimes happens, and sometimes how packages break, is you will upload a version from CRAN, a newer package version of a package that you initially you know, installed via Bioconductor, not knowingly, be just simply because you were installing it as a dependency of another, another package, and that's how you break it. And so sometimes just you know, downloading it via Bioconductor with the BioC manager um, colon colon install command will actually help you get the right version. So that's one way. But that doesn't that doesn't by any means solve all of these cases. If there's like a particular version of R that doesn't work, what you can try is try a different version of R, like literally downgrade your R, which you know with an R Studio server, a professional R Studio server is actually pretty easy because it allows you to have different versions of R. With without that, there are things like um, for R on your home computer, not on a server environment. There are things like switch R, um, which is a tool that will allow you to switch R versions there. So that's something to try. But yeah, it's not, not a perfect world and it's very annoying when packages break. <laughs> okay, I think we'll, there's quite a few questions coming in, but we are gonna to have to leave it there for today. Are there any last things that you'd like to share with people, Saskia? No, I, well, I think, I think thank you so much for hosting me. Um, this was a really nice experience. Um, and I just think everyone, you know, join our Twitter, have a look and really, I hope, I think we hopefully live up to, you know, our reputation of being a really kind and supportive community. So don't, don't feel afraid to reach out to anyone. Thanks a lot. And for those of you asking about the links to the different resources that have been mentioned, they will be shared with the slides along with the recording and I will let you know when that's available. Before we wrap up today, there are a couple other things that I would like to tell you about. Just give me a moment and I'll share my screen again. 
So if you are interested in learning more about R and specifically about how you can use it to work with genomic sequences, we have a workshop coming up on that. That is going to be on the 23rd of September and applications for that workshop will close in early September. So do go and check out the information on that on our website. This week, we also have two more webinars on the different types of compute available to Australian researchers. The first is where to go when your bioinformatics outgrows your compute. So thinking about uh, whether you can just use your own laptop or if you need to go up to something like HPC. And then the second webinar will be looking at the NCMAS application scheme for getting access to high performance bioinformatics computing within Australia. The information about all of these events is available on the BioCommons website. So thank you again, Saskia, for a great webinar and thank you to everybody for joining us. One last thing to tell you is that is to acknowledge our funding. The Australian BioCommons is enabled by NCRIS via BioPlatforms Australia funding. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you in another webinar again soon.